Hello, I'm LaVon Roberson. Thank you so much for joining me tonight for the Bookish Report. It's when we talk about books and everything bookish. I'll be talking tonight with Minette Coleman. She's the author of her latest historical novel, and it's called The Tree, A Journey to Freedom. Minette, thank you so much for joining me tonight on the Bookish Report. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So I want to start off with the title of your, your, your latest book. And you call it The Tree, A Journey to Freedom. So what's a tree got to do with getting to freedom? Well, I graduated from Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. And if any of you know the Guilford College area, there is a large 300-year-old tulip poplar that's on campus. And it is the focal point of my novel. I based the tree on this humongous, beautiful <laughs> tree that I had never seen before until last summer, but I'd heard all the stories about it. And um, I really liked the Guilford Woods. They are untouched. And the Guilford College um, campus is now part of the National Park Service uh, Railroad Tour to Freedom. So you can visit this and understand the Underground Railroad, understand what our ancestors had to go through before they got there. This tree is an amazing sight, but I created a story around it. As most stories that I write start, what if you could get to this tree and you could be free? Hmm, that's really powerful. So the tree actually exists. Yes. And in your historical fiction book, the lead character is Epsi. And tell me a little bit about Epsi. Epsi starts out in this book the way other slave novels don't start. I know that's kind of backwards to say it that way, but Epsi's story begins with not knowing that there is such a thing as freedom. And she's a little girl. Her mother is dead. She's raised by three women. She calls them mamas, kind of like my Greek chorus. Um, but she's a slave on a plantation. And she goes from not knowing anything, not knowing how to read, not knowing what colors are, not knowing what the sky is learning all these things from all the people around her and she's a very strong-willed young lady and so I take her in this novel from the time when she's about six or seven through the time when she's around 14 or 15 and decides it's time to go. Mm -hmm. One of the most fascinating things for me about your story mm -hmm. is the evolution of Epsi because I think that's what sets the tree, A Journey to Freedom, apart from other stories about this distinctly American experience. So she evolves. It's not as if right away she knows about freedom. She only knows what she's experienced. So I love how you, just tell us a little bit more about that unfolding, for instance, the scene where she learns how to walk is if because that to me capsulizes a lot of what you've been that's saying. the f favorite my favorite part of the book is as a writer as a, this is an aside but as a writer you get to create wonderful scenes that you think might have happened and so I got this idea of how does one walk free? How do you look like you're free? Slaves were told that they were supposed to do this. They couldn't look in the man's face. They could not raise their eyes. They could not smile or say anything. And we know this still existed until today in some areas where you cannot even look at white people. So. This Epsi went from being a child who knew what she was supposed to do as a little girl. I'm not supposed to say anything. I'm supposed to stay out of the way. 
I'm a darkie running around mm -hmm. in my little shirt mm -hmm. and this girl meets all these people in her life who determine who help her rather determine who she's going to be and the scene where she learns where to walk how to walk rather uh, starts off with a new woman on the plantation by the name of Gal and Gal is always talking about freedom and Epsi doesn't get it because you don't know what's yeah, out there exactly. she doesn't yeah. know what's that's out what there. I loved about your book yeah and so if you don't know what's out there why would you go out there and try to <laughs> be free mm -hmm. e especially if you didn't understand what freedom meant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Gal comes up with uh, explaining to her how she learned how to walk and talk and stand up straight mm -hmm. your head up mm -hmm. your chest out mm -hmm. your shoulders back mm -hmm. and walk down the street mm -hmm. like you're free exactly. and Epsi practices this whenever she can and the big problem with that is most of the older slaves or enslaved persons on the plantation they don't like it yeah. they're afraid of they're it they're afraid of it and they're afraid of what will happen to her. Yeah. And when little children start mimicking her, which is what you want exactly. kids to do, yeah. they get knocked in the head and told you, don't do that, she's crazy. Yes, yes, I thought that was really fascinating because it helped me, the reader, understand how the tree of journey to freedom looks at this distinctly or peculiar institution from a very different point of view. So I would urge readers to be looking for that when you pick up a copy of the tree because it is a very different way of understanding, perceiving freedom. We assume some things, but Manette Coleman, your book helps us to understand that it is about becoming, okay, becoming and understanding the unfolding of Epsi Hazard. Another fascinating story that you tell in the tree or theme in the the, um, the tree, a journey to, to freedom, is the different decisions that um, people who aren't free, whose unpaid and slave labor is used, as well as free blacks, okay? The decisions that they make about how to navigate that reality. So we see uh, as runaway slaves and free people in different kinds of settings and these different settings help us understand they're making decisions about how to navigate this which is another reason I think you might want to look at you readers out there the tree a journey to freedom so talk a little bit about that well the first thing is to clarify runaway slaves didn't that's not what they called themselves they called themselves running aways they didn't even use the word slave, okay? They were running away, and that was it. And you can't, one of the lessons we all need to learn in life is that you can't do anything by yourself. So we're not only following the history of Epsi, but we're following the history of abolitionists, of freemen who were worried that they might get caught and resold because the slave patrols were always out there and they made decisions on how they would help the abolitionists or most importantly the Quakers. Guilford is a Quaker college and the tree is on old Quaker property and a lot of people do not know this but Levi Coffin, a Quaker, was considered the father of the Underground Railroad he and his cousin Vestal Coffin, um, they were part of a group of Quakers in North Carolina that paid for 780 or 90 enslaved people to become free. But they were told after these people were free, those free people, those free black people could not stay in North Carolina. Mm, so mm. this is, so that's what they did to help. Mm. Then there were people that were freed who went on to take people on the Underground Railroad, exactly. be conductors, mm -hmm. to meet people at the tree. Yeah. Because if, because the legend that I've created is, if you can get to the tree, you can get to freedom. So 
there would be people helping with the, the wagons. And we've all heard the stories about people hiding in the bottoms of wagons. Right. Um, yeah. But I do some other creative yes, stuff do. with the wagons. It's trust amazing. Me. And, um, <laughs> but, in, but you have to use your imagination and understand that we don't know all the stories that happened back then. Just because the WPA project back in the 30s allowed people to go out and interview former enslaved people does not mean we got all the stories. Exactly. We only got some of them. And one of the things that came up that was very important in these interviews was that when they became free, it wasn't what it was all chalked up to be. Mm. So a mm. lot of them mm. felt that they were better off as slaves mm. because nobody wanted to hire them. Mm -hmm. If they were hired, they weren't given a fair wage. Mm -hmm. They weren't given good places to stay. Mm -hmm. So think about all those people, their ancestors, our ancestors, who made those decisions to help people get freedom and then they end up in a place like the tent city yeah. in Washington DC. Yeah. Well it's actually um, in Virginia really. But there was no place for them to go. Yeah. Yeah. So these people worked hard. And this is why I tell people, you have freedom now. Go vote. <laughs> That's one thing. Make your voice heard. You don't have to sit like this. You don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to go through all the things that Epsi had to go through before she ended up on this plantation in Ohio working and helping them in, as the book unfolds to get other people exactly. to be free. To be free. And you, uh, the decision, so example, so one example, which is why I think the tree, A Journey to Freedom, is different when it comes to, because you tell a different story. Your story is very multi-layered. So you talk about a group of runaways who decide that they may not see light, okay, but they're going to make the decision to be free and this is the decision that, so this is what I mean. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, and that's historically, that's based on this history. This is what happens. People decided, I couldn't take it anymore. And so they would leave. And their options were not many. Usually they had to leave at night. And that was the safest way to do it. So you could hide and work out your walk in the dark and sleep during the day and you'd run across a lot of different places that you did not want to be and you also had to be aware of the slave patrols. But there were a lot of people who did not make it, not necessarily to the tree, they didn't make it far off the plantation. They would be brought back and the punishment for being brought back to the plantation was severe. There are lots of different punishments and um, I don't want to go into them but they were very, very awful, it's a bad, it's a bad part of United States history. It, it really is. is. And so those slaves who didn't go that far from the imprisonment of the plantation, mm -hmm. they may have made a decision to go underground, perhaps? Yes. Well, there is a, a one And that's part. based on history. There were... There's a place in the Carolinas called the Great Dismal Swamp. It really exists. It's actually a National Historic Site. You can actually still get lost in it today if you're from North Carolina, you know what I'm talking about. But back during the time when they were importing Africans to this country to be enslaved, some of them got off the boat and ran into the swamp. And when they went into the swamp, nobody was going to come after them. They were never found. Um, they became known here, and this also happened in the Caribbean, yeah. they became known as Maroons. Yeah. And the Maroons created a society that was not only hidden in the swamp, but they were also underground. And so I use that uh, story, one of those stories, in my book as well, where Epsi, on her way to freedom, runs across this, uh, one of the groups. Yes. 
yes. that's underground. That's living underground. That's living underground. Mm -hmm. And there, a uh, one historic fact about it was that some of them had lived underground so long that some of their children were born blind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's amazing what people went through. Yes. Not to have to exactly. be enslaved. Not to have to, and I love it because all those different ways of navigating slavery, of trying to make a free life for yourself, is explored in this one book in a narrative form because Sylvia Diop at Schomburg has done extensive research about those maroon colonies. And yes. you have this in your book. You also have, as you mentioned, the hiding in special uh, cutouts in the wagon. Also, in buildings, right there in plain sight, you have people, the slaves, hiding. You show us in your narrative, in your historical fiction, how you use this history to create a fictional, quote, fictional world that really is based on history. So that leads me to my next question. Mm -hmm. So, um, The Tree, A Journey to Freedom is your third historical fiction novel. Yes. Tell me about that. What is it about historical fiction and you, Manette Coleman? <laughs> well, I never set out to write historical fiction. I set out to write. When I was a little girl, my uh, father was a newspaper editor. And he and my mother actually met at a poetry club That's when they were in... Jefferson Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. That's how they met. And so they both wrote poetry a lot. So I grew up writing poetry. Mm. I grew up working at the newspaper and, and writing reviews and stuff like that. I started off writing plays. I was a terrible playwright. It's a really bad playwright. <laughs> but in order to become better, one has to keep writing. And after a while, I won a couple of awards for some of my poetry. But I said I always wanted to write a novel mm. and they tell you when you start to write especially when you're in school they tell you to write what you know so I kind of did that with my first novel The Blacksmith's Daughter I knew that I my grandfather had five daughters and one son who had polio and that's all I knew so I didn't know much but I researched the history of the time because I wanted to write a story about my kind of my family. These were people I never met. All these people were dead by the time I was born. And so I get to go back, look up the history of the 1920s and 1930s, what it was like to be a well-off blacksmith with a family and have all the accoutrements of wealth, but you can't really be considered wealthy because you're black. And so... I wrote that, and at the same time, I was thinking, oh, this is, this is a fun story. This is fun to do. What else can I write? <laughs> and then I got to writing, uh, thinking about my f two of the scrapbooks that my father kept from his articles in the Atlanta Daily World. And they covered a period of time when I was, I, when I was not even born, come to think of it, um, where a black man had been put on trial for raping a white woman and he had been executed. Mm. That's the facts. Mm. He didn't do it. That's also the fact. Mm. And, um, and, and that was the case a lot. These two trials, one of them, the judge had to throw the trial out of court because the man they were accusing of raping the white woman had been in the drunk tank in another town. Oh. So they How could about not, that for right, some evidence? Right. So they couldn't, you know, <laughs> legally do this. But this story, uh, No Death by Unknown Hands, my second novel, takes place in what you call the kind of the beginnings of the civil rights movement where people are trying to make a, a move, trying to be involved in stuff right after the anti-lynching laws went into effect. Mm. And so I took the title, strangely enough, from a poem, because as a, ah, a daughter of yeah, poets yeah. and a person who writes poetry, yeah. I was looking for poems for my main character in that novel to quote. 
And I'm looking through this book of American Negro Poetry. It's a fascinating book. And there's this poem in there that's based on an article that was written in the New York Times ah. in 1919. And uh, history tells us that 1919 was a very vicious time mm. for black people mm. in this country. Mm. Our men had returned from mm. serving in the First World War mm. and wanted their rights, but yeah. they were not going to be yeah. given to And it, whenever they spoke up, a riot broke out. Yeah, the Red, red Summer. Yeah. yeah, it was really, mm -hmm. really horrible. Yeah. So there was, but, but this takes place in Georgia, and the first two books, uh, uh, this no Death and The Blacksmith's Daughter both, both take place in Atlanta. But this article took place in southern Georgia where this man was being transported from some crime. I do not know what the crime was and they did not st state it in the article. But he was being transported to another town so that he could get a fair trial. Mm -hmm. Like that was going to happen. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he was supposed to be watched by someone on the train. A sheriff's deputy. And the deputy was not paying attention, or he was involved in the fact that men came yeah, on the yeah, train, yeah. took him off, and beat him to death, and they found mm -hmm. him in a river down the road. So does she know her history or not? Okay. I, try, I try. So the title of that book, that historical fiction is? No Death by Unknown Hands. Okay. And the reason it's called that is because in the article, the coroner said, when he examined the body, that... This man had died by hands unknown. Uh. And so I took the tile and I turned it around to mm. say that we have this civil rights movement now. We have this movement now where we want to be totally free. And we want no more deaths by mm. unknown hands. Oh, that's So beautiful. that's why it's no death by unknown that's hands. That's beautiful. And it also helped me because you started off talking about your parents. And you definitely are a great researcher. I know you historian for the Guilford College Black Alumni Association. Um, and that brings me to connections that you are able to make. So I love how, yes, you're a researcher, you're a historian, but you make connections, personal connections to your stories. Um, and I think that helps us, that shows us the way about how history can also be a pathway to our finding our own connections and now you're running connection workshops can you talk just a little well, bit about that the first one I did was to really connect the history of blacks and Quakers a Friends Association of Higher Education asked me to come in and do a workshop to talk about these connections and everything is based on a tree if you go back <laughs> and look at everything you know I tell people the predominant culture that we are taught about is not the trunk of the tree. Mm. It's a branch of the tree. Mm. It may be a branch that's higher and the newer branches are at the top. So you, every time something new evolves and you get to learn more about it, these branches start um, spreading out. So as to show that they still got it, you know, that, you know, they have it. But we're all connected by these branches of the tree. So most people do not know that Paul Roberson is a descendant of Quakers and a Native American. They do not know so much. I can't even go into all the history and stuff, but it's, but these people, everything is connected yeah. and there's so many connections to be made. So it's easy to sit down to look up something and say, okay, how am I connected to you? Exactly. How am I connected yeah. to you? I can start off by saying, LaVon and I are connected by my freshman college roommate. And we're connected, I just realized this, because we both went to Quaker schools, colleges. I did not think about it until this very minute. So yeah, Look for your connections. And in that vein, I want you to know that Minette Coleman will be giving a free connection workshop as well as a book signing for the tree uh, in just two weeks uh, in Harlem at Sisters Uptown Bookstore at 156th in Amsterdam. That's going to be on Saturday, April 28th. So come and find out how your personal connections may help navigate you through history and you will feel more connected to it. So. 
if you were to give us a little hint about what you're working on now, what's next for Manette Coleman? Another historical fiction? Your fourth? <laughs> what's going on? Don't want to jinx I it. I have but. so many different books going <laughs> on in my head. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's according to how you look at it, I have a lot of books that I have started writing. Uh, the latest thing that I have been working on is <laughs> it's called um, Oh, you have the title? No. Oh. Well, I, I kind of had a title, but I got rid of it. But it's about <laughs> it's about uh, teenagers back, well, preteens, oh. back in the early 1960s. And I thought about the fact that a lot of times we don't read stories about groups of uh, black kids that work together to solve a kind of a murder mystery. Mm. And this isn't really a murder mystery, but think about the Atlanta child murders. This happened long before that. So I'm working on that and getting yeah. it together. And oh. as I said before about writing, writing is a lot of fun. Writing is a great way to put your thoughts down, even if you never get published, even if you can only tell your friends about it. Put it down and tell your story. That's another way you can make a connection with anybody. Oh, I love that. that yeah. you, can, you can say, yeah. you know, I wrote this about me. And they'll say, yes, I was thinking about that. And then get their connections. But I love writing. Thank you. It's my life. Yes, we can <laughs> tell. And the historian in you. But it's the making those connections. Definitely. It's been such a joy having you here. Thank you so much, Manette. Like I said, thanks for having me. I had a good time. Absolutely, and so did we. Folks, that's it for the Bookish Report tonight. Happy reading. We'll see you next time.